Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Pastor Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel? We invite you to get your Bible and join us if you care to. We're getting ready to have an old-fashioned Bible study here at the chapel. We'd love to have you join us. We're going to pick it up today, 2 Samuel chapter 14, verse 20. And where we left off in our last lecture was Joab, uh, David's King David's nephew, was trying to get it to where Absalom could return. Absalom took off after he killed his brother Amnon for raping his sister Tamar. And he was at his grandfather's house, Talmai, in Gezer for three years. And Joab is trying to get it to where Absalom can come back to Jerusalem. And he employs the help of a woman uh, who's identified as the woman of Tekoa. And she's a good actress. Uh, she came to David with uh, mourning clothes on and she was acting like uh, she was a poor widow woman and she had two sons and the two sons uh, were fighting in a field and it got out of hand and the one killed the other one. And the other family members were wanting the blood of the son who murdered or killed the other son. He didn't actually murder him. It wasn't premeditated murder. Uh, things happen and it was more or less manslaughter is what it was. But uh, what this deal is, Joab put all these words in this woman of Tekoa's mouth trying to get David to pass judgment in favor of the woman so that they would not slay her only remaining son because that would leave her without a provider for the rest of her life. Uh, uh, widow women in particular depended on their children uh, to keep them in, in food and shelter uh, in their elder years. But uh, David uh, put two and two together and figured out that, the, that it was Joab that put this woman of Tekoa up to this hypothetical situation. But David took an oath and he said, as the Lord liveth, uh, I'm not going to allow your remaining son to be killed. And in doing so, you see, he was kind of passing judgment on Absalom as well because Absalom was within his rights as a kinsman redeemer for his sister Tamar. Uh, Amnon violated two laws of God that are worthy of death. One, incest. Uh, Tamar was his half-sister. Uh, the second uh, being that he raped her. That also uh, worthy of death. And what was in this for Joab? Well, I think he thought that when David died that it would be possible Amnon being the oldest, he's thinking Absalom would be in line for the throne. And if, if I help Absalom get back to Jerusalem, uh, that's going to be to my benefit because uh, Absalom will recognize that I helped him and that will lead me to a, a great position of power. So uh, with that update, let's ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua Jesus' precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day. Pick it up with Second Kings, excuse me, Second Samuel chapter 14, verse 20, and it reads, To fetch about this form, the woman of Tekoa continues to David, of speech hath thy servant Joab done this thing. What she's saying here is he, he disguised this whole affair with a hypothetical situation. And when David figured out that it was Joab that put her up to this, I mean, she threw Joab under the bus in a minute. And my Lord is wise, referring to King David, according to the wisdom of an angel of God, to know all things that are in the earth. King David, you are certainly smarter than Joab, 
and you're certainly uh, more intelligent than myself, and we should have known better than to try and fool you. I think uh, the woman of Tekoa, you see, it's a serious offense to lie to the king, and if it wasn't an out-and-out -out lie, she certainly was deceiving King David, and I'm thinking she's probably uh, of the mind, I better flatter King David with words and then get out of here. Verse 21, and the king said unto Joab, Behold now, I have done this thing. Go therefore, bring the young man Absalom again. Joab is getting his way. Uh, David uh, is starting to lose trust in Joab. He's, he's starting to question Joab's loyalty. Uh, and remember, uh, Joab murdered Abner, uh, Saul's general. And David and Saul, uh, excuse me, Abner, were both high-ranking officers in the military of Israel under Saul. So there was a, uh, a respect there. And David, I don't think, ever forgave uh, Joab for murdering uh, uh, Abner. And, and then later on, uh, from this point in time where we're at now, uh, Ab Joab would also murder Amasa. Verse 22, And Joab fell to the ground on his face, and bowed himself, and thanked the king. And Joab said, Today thy servant knoweth that I have found grace in thy sight, my lord, O king, in that the king hath fulfilled the request of his servant by allowing Absalom to come home. And Absalom is kind of skating on thin ice with David at this point. David knows that, it, and he, he figured it out himself, that Joab had put this woman of Tekoa up to this uh, hypothetical situation which caused David to pass judgment in the woman's favor, and in so doing, uh, he also uh, had to rule in favor of Absalom coming back uh, to Jerusalem. So Joab arose and went to Geshur, and this is to uh, Absalom's grandfather's uh, place uh, in Syria, Talmai being his name, and brought Absalom to Jerusalem. Joab and uh, Absalom are also first cousins uh, in that Joab is the son of David's sister Zariah, uh, Absalom, of course, being the son of David. Verse 24, and the king, this being David, said, Let him turn to his own house, and let him not see my face. So Absalom returned to his own house and saw not the king's face. And I made the comment in verse 1 of chapter 14 that the king's heart, David's heart, was toward Absalom. And that should have been translated, the king's heart was against Absalom. And we see that he's still against Absalom and that he doesn't want to even see his son. He's, you tell him to stay in his apartment and, and not come in my presence. Verse 25, But in all Israel there was none to be so much praised as Absalom for his beauty. From the sole of his foot, even to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. The name Absalom means uh, father of uh, peace, uh, that is to say friendly. Uh, so he, he, he not only was friendly, with the people, as we'll see when we get to chapter 15. He was a good-looking rascal as well. Verse 26, And when he pulled his head, this means when he cut or shaved his hair, for it was at every year's end that he pulled it. Because the hair was heavy on him, therefore he pulled it. He weighed the hair of his head at 200 shekels after the king's weight every year just as they sheared the sheep annually, uh, Absalom would get his hair cut annually. And this uh, 200 shekels after the king's weight is just a little less than four pounds of hair. So he, he grew quite a mane of hair over 
the course of a year. It's a bit ironic too, and when we get to chapter 18, we'll see that that uh, hair will lead to his death. It, it contributes to his death. 27, and unto Absalom there were born three sons and one daughter, whose name was Tamar. She was a woman of fair countenance. Good-looking uh, family was Absalom and his sister Tamar and his daughter Tamar. Note that he named his uh, daughter after his sister who was raped uh, by and shamed by Amnon. Tamar, if you translate it, means palm tree. Now this is very unusual in, in God's Word that it would state that Absalom were born three sons but doesn't name the sons. Uh, when we get to chapter 18, verse 18, uh, it states there that Absalom had no sons and therefore he built a pillar uh, so that his name would not be cut off from remembrance. So evidently these three sons of Absalom died uh, before they were able to have any children, uh, no children, no genealogy. Verse 28, So Absalom dwelt two full years in Jerusalem and saw not the king's face. Three years at his grandfather Talmai and Geshur uh, was he separated from David now two years he's been back in Jerusalem, still not allowed to see his father. That's five years that he has not been allowed to be in the presence of his father, King David. 29, therefore Absalom said for jo sent, I should say, for Joab to have sent him to the king. In other words, here he's going to uh, seek Joab's help in convincing the king to allow Absalom to come into the king's presence. And he would not come to him. And when he sent again the second time, he would not come. Again, Joab knows he's kind of thin, skating on thin ice with David. And he suspects that Absalom wants a favor of him and he knows that's not going to sit well with King David. Will uh, Absalom just let it go since Joab twice refused to come to him? Let's find out. Verse 30, Therefore he, this is Absalom, said unto his servants, See, Joab's field is near mine, and he hath barley there. Go and set it on fire. And Absalom's servant set the field on fire. Well, that ought to get uh, uh, Joab's attention, setting his crop that was ready for harvest on fire. Then Joab arose and came to Absalom unto his house and said unto him, Wherefore or why have thy servants set my field on fire? Absalom is defiant in getting uh, Joab's attention. And Absalom answered Joab, Behold, I sent unto thee, saying, Come hither. I sent for you twice, Joab, that I may send thee to the king to say, Wherefore am I come from Geshur? It had been good for me to have been there still. Now, therefore, let me see the king's face, and if there be any iniquity in me, let him kill me. Let's get to uh, the, the suspense past us. Let, let's get this over with, is what Absalom is saying. It, it would have been better for me to remain at my grandparents' uh, Talme in Geshur. This half forgiveness from my father David is worse the no forgiveness at all is what he's saying. But there was no iniquity in Absalom at this point in time. Well, there might have been iniquity in him, but he could not be held accountable for killing Amnon and that he was within his rights 
under God's law of the kinsman redeemer in uh, avenging the rape of Tamar by killing Amnon. 33. So Joab came to the king and told him. And when he had called for Absalom, he came to the king and bowed himself on his face to the ground before the king. And the king kissed Absalom, a sign that uh, favor has been restored. Uh, I notice nothing is said about Joab uh, wanting uh, redemption or repayment for his crop of barley. It's kind of like he just, why did you set my field of barley on fire, Joab? And he told him and he just kind of let it go. So I guess he was okay with that. But um, remember too that Joab knows what David did to Uriah the Hittite. So I think that's another reason that Joab uh, was a little cautious when he realized he was skating on thin ice with David. You see, very few people knew what David had done to Uriah the Hittite. God looked upon that as murder, as we studied in chapter 12 of this book of 2 Samuel. Now, if David had killed Joab, his secret would have gone to the grave with Joab. So I think Joab being a little cautious, uh, knowing that he holds some secrets that David would just as soon be in the grave. David loved Absalom, but he had taken his own brother's life. So even though biblical law supports what Absalom did, David had a difficult time forgiving Absalom, but he did. Chapter 15, uh, we come to Absalom's rebellion. Now, I, I don't know if possibly uh, some Ill, Ill feelings were born uh, in Absalom because of the length of time that his father basically ignored him. Uh, three years in Geshur, uh, two years in Jerusalem, and David wouldn't see him. And uh, that could cause some, some hard feelings from Absalom's part. And as a result of that, in chapter 15, we're going to see Absalom's rebellion against David. It almost cost David his life. Chapter 15, verse 1. And it came to pass after this that Absalom prepared, prepared him chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. Here he's showing off uh, all the pomp and circumstance of the king being moved from place to place in Jerusalem. What this is saying is he would get his chariot with his horses and then he hired 50 men to run before him. Make way, make way for the prince Absalom. Uh, make way, he's going to the post office or the library. Uh, his brother, younger brother Adoniah, Adoniah would pull the same stunt when he was trying to usurp the throne from uh, the one God selected to be the king after David, that being Solomon. Verse 2, he had quite an ego thing going here. And Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate. The gate of the city was the place of judgment. And it was so that when any man that had a controversy came to the king for judgment, then Absalom called unto him and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is one of the tribes of Israel. I'm from the tribe of Dan. So what he's doing is he's setting himself up to be the judge. Uh, he's a false judge. And He's also going to be a false king. We see a, a type of Antichrist written all over Absalom. He's going to try and take the throne from the rightful king, King David, God's anointed. Notice this too, of what city art thou? If you, uh, we live in a very rural area here in, in Arkansas. 
And I've noticed when I go to a large city, you want to be careful of anybody that walks up to you and says, where are you from? I guarantee you they are either a con artist or a salesman or a sales lady, as the case may be. When someone walks up to you, a stranger on, on the streets of New York City and says, where are you from? My advice to you would be to tuck your head and just keep on walking. Verse 3. And Absalom said unto him, See, thy matters are good and right. This is to the man who was from Dan who came for judgment in a matter. But there is no man deputed or appointed of the king to hear thee. That King David is not doing his job. He should either hear your cause or he should appoint someone to be here in the gate to be the judge of your case. Verse 4, And Absalom said moreover, O oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man which hath any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice. Boy, is he puffed up and on an ego trip. What he's saying is, it's too bad for you that I'm not the king of Israel. Because if I were the king, the judge, I would certainly judge in your favor. The only problem of that is that if you are a judge and you are deciding between two parties that are in dispute, you're not going to please both of them. One of them is going to be pleased, but you cannot please both of them. Being a judge is uh, sometimes a very difficult position. Um, sometimes you have to make decisions that are not all that popular, but you don't have to, you don't, you should not worry about making a popular decision if you're a judge. You should de be determined to make a decision based on what's right and what's wrong. But you see what he's doing, Absalom is casting suspicion uh, upon David by the people. That King David, he's not doing his job. He should have somebody down here to hear your cause. Verse 5, And it was so that when any man came nigh to him to do him obedience, to bow down before royalty, he is a prince, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. I mean, he is a good old boy. And what he would be saying is to these folks, well, now you go back to Dan, and I want you to tell everybody what a great guy Absalom is, and I also want you to go back and tell them that King David is not doing his job. He didn't have anybody down there at the gate uh, where the court is to hear my cause. What's wrong with that King David? Verse 6. And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel to bring them over to his side uh, using strategy, and he did it quite secretly as well. Verse 7, And it came to pass after forty years that Absalom said unto the king, I pray thee, let me go and pay my vow, which I have vowed unto the Lord in Hebron. Forty years. Uh, scholars go, forty years from what? Uh, David was only the king of Israel for a total of forty years. Uh, what works out here mathematically when uh, Samuel anointed David the king of Israel while Saul was still very much in power back in 1 Samuel chapter 16 would have been approximately 40 uh, years prior to the time we're at here. Now Hebron, I'll remind you, is uh, where uh, Absalom was born. Uh, it's where David first established the capital when he was the king over Judah only. Uh, Absalom is making this up about having a vow 
that he needed to go to Hebron to fulfill. Verse 8, For thy servant, he continues to King David, referring to himself, vowed a vow while I abode at Geshur in Syria. When I was at my grandfather's Talmai, I made a vow, saying, If the Lord shall bring me again indeed to Jerusalem, then I will serve the Lord. How could David forbid Absalom from going to Hebron to fulfill a vow that he had made to the Lord and to go to serve the Lord? David could not. Verse 9, And the king said unto him, Go in peace. So he arose and went to Hebron, the conspiracy in place. And you know, there's uh, known as the shadow government where you have a conspiracy uh, by powerful people to control the government from behind the scenes, around the elected officials. We have a prime example of that in Absalom. David was the anointed king of Israel, uh, rightfully uh, the, had the responsibilities of being judge. You have one here who is exercising his power as the uh, prince below David to usurp that authority and control the outcome of things uh, operating behind the scenes. Verse 10, But Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as ye hear the sound of the trumpet, then ye shall say, Absalom reigneth in Hebron. I'm going to steal the throne from God's anointed. Again, we see a strong type for the Antichrist in, in uh, Absalom. Antichrist is also going to try and steal the throne from God's anointed. I'm speaking of Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, many are being set up to be deceived by him. They're going to believe him hook, line, and sinker. <clears throat> Verse 11, And with Absalom went 200 men out of Jerusalem that were called. In other words, they were invited to uh, like a sacrificial meal. And they went in their simplicity. They, they went innocent. They, they didn't realize that Absalom was trying to steal the throne from King David. And they knew not anything. The conspiracy uh, was kept in secret. Verse 12, And Absalom sent for Ahithophel the Gilonite, David's counselor, from his city, even from Gilo, while he offered sacrifices. And the conspiracy was strong, for the people increased continually with Absalom. Folks uh, liked his false promises. Uh, his lies concerning, uh, just like the Antichrist when he returns, he's going to be uh, lying to the people as well. He's going to come in peacefully and prosperously. He's going to promise people anything, uh, only one catch. You have to worship him. Uh, Absalom's only one little catch. Uh, you have to put me in the role of king. Now, Ahithophel was a very trusted advisor to David. He was a high-ranking officer in David's cabinet. So the fact that he is betraying David and siding with Absalom points to how uh, totally the nation was turned from David to Absalom. Verse 13, and there came a messenger to David, saying, The hearts of the men of Israel are after Absalom. Psalm 41 and Psalm 55 uh, both uh, are writings of David concerning this particular time in his life. The, the sorrow that he felt at the rebellion, not only of his son Absalom, but the betrayal uh, of David by his close friends and counselors, such as Ahithophel. 
And David said unto all his servants that were with him at Jerusalem, Arise and let us flee, for we will sh shall not escape from Absalom. Make speed to depart, lest he overtake us suddenly, and bring evil upon us, and smite the city with the edge of the sword. Running was not David's style. Uh, from the time he was 16 years old, uh, you remember we had that giant, the champion of Gath, Goliath. Did David run from Goliath? No, he ran toward Goliath. David wasn't afraid of anything. And there are two thoughts as to why David fled Jerusalem. I think first he didn't want to have a civil war where there would be blood shed on the streets of Jerusalem. The second thing is I think David is buying some time. You see, if his trusted advisor Ahithophel had gone over into Absalom's camp, who else has gone over into Absalom's camp? Who, who can I trust uh, and who can I not trust? I need a little time to sort all that out. Verse 15, And the king's servant said unto the king, Behold, thy servants are ready to do whatsoever my lord the king shall appoint. We're, we're willing to fight. We're willing to stand with you and fight against Absalom and his. Or if you think it's best, that we flee Jerusalem, that's what we'll do. Verse 16, And the king went forth, and all his household after him. And the king left ten women, which were concubines, to keep the house. These ten concubines, uh, prophecy fulfilled. Uh, you recall in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 11, uh, the, God said, the sword will never part from your house through the prophet Nathan. He also said, evil will come upon your house and your wives, which concubines certainly fall into that category, uh, are going to be taken under the sun, meaning you, David, took Bathsheba in secret, in hiding, but uh, the Lord gave ten, uh, these ten concubines to be taken under the sun by a stranger, by Absalom to be exact. Uh, in other words, under the sun so that everyone would know it. Well, it's not looking good for David and the few, uh, evidently few, supporters that he still has. So don't miss the next lecture. We'll see how this situation turns out with Absalom's rebellion. We got a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment, won't you please? The book of James. James is a book that I know you'll enjoy because it is written when you rightly divide it to those that are scattered abroad. That's to say the 12 tribes, the 10 tribes scattered abroad, being very specific in your freedom of Christianity, the repentance, uh, giving much personal instruction as far as controlling our thoughts and finding peace and giving us those parameters wherein Christianity uh, defining those things that come from the Word of God. Example, that uh, bitter and sweet water cannot come from the same spring. Well, from God's Word, you should not have both either. The practice of healing brought forth in this book of James. I know you're going to like it. James, that great book of instruction. Welcome back. We're glad you could join back with us. Let's have the 800 number, please. 800-643-4645. That number good throughout Puerto Rico, the U.S., and Canada. If you have a biblical question that you'd like to pose to be answered on the air, feel free to call that number and leave your question. We do ask that you not ask questions about a specific individual denomination or organization by name. Uh, we try to teach God's Word in a positive manner. Throwing out negative about others by name serves no purpose. We simply won't do it. We'll let God's Word do the teaching, the correcting, and the healing. 
Uh, please keep your questions of a biblical nature as well. And also, while we're at it, let me mention, don't ask for a written response to your questions. We simply don't have the time or staff to provide a written response to everyone that would like to have one. And if we don't have it time, time to do it for all, we will do it for none. If you're studying via the internet somewhere around the world and unable to use that 800 number to leave a question, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Quite all right to mail your questions in. Got a prayer request? We can do away with the telephone number. You don't need a telephone. You don't need a mailing address. Talk to your Heavenly Father. You know, He's there for you 24-7. I don't care what you're doing. You can pray and talk to Him. Uh, you don't have to go through any fancy rigmarole and get down beside your bed on your knees and close your eyes and clasp your hands together. You can talk to your Heavenly Father when you're driving down uh, the highway. So uh, talk to your Father. It, it makes His day when you have time for Him. There's a lot of His children that don't make time for Him, I promise you. We do have these prayer requests, Father. We come united as one in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask you to look upon these, Father. You know their needs, uh, maritable pro marital problems, financial difficulties. You know, Father, if it is your will, a special blessing on each of these. Watch over, guide, direct, touch, heal. We also lift up our military troops are in harm's way around the world. Watch over and bring our troops safely home in Jesus' precious name. Amen and thank you, Father. Let's get to some questions. And we have Anonymous. If a person drinks a lot, but he still believes in Jesus, will he go to heaven? Yeah, he can drink all the water he wants. No, I'm kidding. Uh, drinking alcohol, and I know that's what you're talking about, whoever you are, in, in excess is not healthy. Um, but it alone would not prevent someone from going to heaven. And the reason I say it alone, that sometimes alcohol causes people to do things that are against the law. And uh, it, it can make people do crazy things. Uh, uh, so uh, that's what I meant by it alone would not cause you. It could also, alcohol could also get in the way of you having a relationship with your Heavenly Father. If you stay drunk all the time, you're certainly not going to spend any significant amount of time worshiping the Lord. Louise from Alabama, thank you for teaching God's Word in an easy understanding manner. You're welcome. When we are all changed into our spiritual bodies at the seventh trump. Will be, we be male or female? Neither. Uh, we'll be as the angels that Jesus spoke of in Matthew chapter 22, verse 30. And the scribes and Pharisees put a hypothetical situation on Jesus there and said, uh, this woman had a husband who didn't have, raise up seed to her. They didn't have any children. And her husband died and his brother married her. He didn't raise up seeds. All in all, seven brothers married this woman and did not. And none of them raised up children. And they asked in the resurrection, in other words, after the flesh life, who, which one is she gonna be married to? And Jesus said, you heir in your thinking and you don't understand the power of God. For in the resurrection, after the flesh life, in other words, they neither give or take in marriage, but are as the angels. Spiritually speaking, we're all going to be feminine because we'll be the bride of Christ. <clears throat> Tammy and Paul in Illinois. Thank you for your teaching. Every day I learn something new. That's a good thing. Uh, people should have that as a goal uh, to learn something new every day. Uh, I something new. I had my husband loves to talk about it. I and my husband love to talk about it, and we try to use it in our everyday life. That's important to be able to apply God's word to our everyday lives. I thank you and your staff for being. Uh, it 
into bringing it into our home and lives. You're welcome. My question, uh, are we, oh, we are doing judges. I guess that means you're studying judges. And Joshua, <clears throat> Joshua died. Was there not another leader of Israel or just judges? Well, uh, Joshua, as you probably know, God chose to replace Moses when Moses messed up and struck the rock twice and, and claimed to, to, that he was partially responsible for bringing water forth from the rock. Uh, that cost uh, Moses and Aaron the promised land. God said, you're not going into the promised land because you did that. Uh, as I said, the Lord lifted up Joshua and Israel was doing very well up until Joshua died. Then things, there was no leader as you suspected. And the people started doing what was right in their own eyes rather than what was right in God's eyes. And God brought oppressors, enemies against Israel. And then the people would start crying and the Lord would hear them and he would send a deliverer, a judge. Uh, and the judge in the Hebrew language, Shofetim, which is from the prime Shafat, which means to set things right and rule. And there weren't a continuous line of judges either. People seem to think that uh, when Judge A uh, died, there was Judge B, and then Judge B died and there was Judge C. There were periods of time between the judges, and that's when people of Israel always started messing up. Uh, when they didn't have a strong leader keeping them focused on doing things God's way, they would take off on their own agenda and do their things uh, what was right in their own eyes rather than right in God's eyes. Cora in California, as a child I was baptized by sprinkling of water and not submersion. If I don't uh, get baptized by submersion, am I going to hell? Well, let me answer your question this way. If you were an infant when you were sprinkled uh, if I were you, I would want to be uh, baptized having, knowing that I made the decision myself. Because if you were an infant, you had nothing to do with that decision to be baptized. But as far as you wanting to know, will I go to hell? No, you're not going to go to hell for not being baptized by submersion. Uh, having said that, Jesus was <clears throat> our example and he was baptized, so it's good thing that we're baptized. And when someone's baptized, what are they doing? They're stating their belief that Jesus Christ was born in the flesh, uh, was crucified on the cross for our sins, went into that tomb, and praise God, three and a half days later, he resurrected. The baptism being symbolic of the death, burial, and resurrection. When you come up out of the water, uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Naomi, and we don't know where Naomi is from. Since we have the Holy Spirit to guide us here on earth in our flesh bodies, but we may not listen to what the Holy Spirit is telling us all the time, is this the same as refusing the Holy Spirit when we are brought up before the evil one? I hope this made sense. I know that I have done things that may have gone against my better judgment, so I wonder if this is the same thing as refusing the Holy Spirit. I just want to see what your opinion is on this question. Well, the answer to your question is, is no. Um, that would not be blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. You kind of answered the question yourself. It's, it, when you're delivered up to the, before the evil one, before the Antichrist, and if, you should, if you're one of God's election and you should refuse the Holy Spirit, that's unforgivable. And, but anything that you have done, Naomi, in your life is forgivable up to this point. It's not possible that anyone has committed the unforgivable sin at this time. 
Ellen in Illinois, do angels have wings? And the answer to that is no, angels don't have wings. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, the Lord says there, let us make man in our image. Who was he talking to? He was talking to the angels. And they, we are made in the image of God and the angels. Do we have wings? No, we don't have wings, neither do angels. The belief uh, that angels have wings likely uh, comes from uh, the biblical description of the cherubim who were responsible for protecting the mercy seat. Uh, in King Solomon's temple as well, uh, they had uh, two very large cherubim who the wingspan was from wall to wall, I think some 40 feet approximately, or 40 cubits in the uh, Holy of Holies. And uh, what was their job? Their job was to protect, and therefore the wings were seen as covering in a protecting posture. Also, the, the fact that, that people think that angels have wings is because they don't understand the God's Word in Ezekiel uh, chapter 1, where we're talking about vehicles that were as wings. I understand Ezekiel, the, the most modern technology of transportation he had seen was an ox-drawn cart. And then God's throne shows up and they have these vehicles that brought God's throne to earth. Uh, that when it says that they were amber, check that out in your strong concordance, that means highly polished bronze. So uh, Ezekiel, when he saw them flying around, he said they had wings because the only thing he had seen fly was a bird. Patsy in Illinois, if I continue to go to my church who may or may not talk about the rapture and give them tithes, uh, am, I, am, am I supporting the devil? I enjoy the music and praising of the Lord with other people, but I believe that the Antichrist comes first. Uh, I need help. I listen every day. Well, uh, the scripture you should allow to guide you, uh, Patsy, is the uh, second epistle of John, uh, along about verses 10 and 11, where it states there that if any comes to you and has not this doctrine, meaning the doctrine of Jesus Christ, you don't invite them into your home, neither do you wish them God's speed. And to wish someone God's speed is a common salutation such as have a nice day. And if you tithe to a church that's not teaching God's word correctly, the doctrine of Jesus Christ, but falsely teaching people the rapture, uh, you uh, are in danger of partaking of their evil deeds. You get what they get on judgment day. Be careful. <clears throat> Lisa from California. And when the dinosaurs were here on earth where their uh, people also know uh, dinosaurs were present on the earth in the first earth age. And how do we know they were here? Well, <laughs> have you ever seen the fossils, uh, the, the skeletal remains of a dinosaur? Quite amazing, awesome. But there, there was no flesh man in the first earth age. Um, and if you're not familiar with what we're talking about, uh, God's Word documents that there were dinosaurs on earth. Uh, in Job chapter 40, verse 15, and the following verses, uh, the dinosaurs there are called behemoth. And if you take a sixth grader and give them paper and pencil or crayons, and you ask them to draw as you read the description of behemoth, uh, you'll get something that resembles a dinosaur. Paul in Washington. My question concerning the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. They have discovered the remains of a temple in the city of David, just south of the Temple Mount, uh, near the Gihon Spring. 
and you give some scripture. Considering the political implications of building on the Temple Mount, seems it would be easier to build in the city of David. I wonder if that could be God's plan all along. Thought I should check with you your thoughts, sir. Okay, well, those who are awaiting uh, a temple to be rebuilt or a red heifer to be born uh, are likely going to be deceived. The temple that Jesus said he could rebuild in three days if they tore it down was his body when he resurrected from the tomb. And we being a member of his body, the many-membered body of Jesus Christ, are part of that temple as well. John in North Carolina, uh, my question is, was Satan a serpent or a man when God said Genesis 3.15? Genesis 3.15, the first uh, prophecy in God's Word. And Satan never was a man, in, as we would think of it, in the flesh. He was in his role as the serpent in the garden. And he was able to impregnate Eve which is obvious by Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, when he tells Eve, I'm going to greatly multiply thy conception. Uh, she had conceived, and she had conceived uh, her, the, the first child she gave birth to, Cain. Faith in Minnesota. Um, why does Jesus tell his disciples to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves in Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. Be wise as the serpent, in other words, be wise as Satan, but, uh, and a dove are known for being innocent. Uh, protect your credibility. Doves are also um, symbolic of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. When Jesus was baptized, uh, doves descended and uh, landed upon him and uh, then that voice came from heaven this is my uh, beloved son in who am I am well pleased uh, also can you explain Mark chapter 9 verses 38 through 40 and there John said to Jesus uh, we saw someone casting out devils in your name and we told them to stop it and Jesus said unto them uh, forbid him not. And then he goes on to say in verse 40, for he that is not against us is on our part. In other words, as part of the many-membered body of Jesus Christ, the disciples were trying to create a monopoly, if you will, on Jesus Christ. That wasn't the reason Jesus came to earth. The disciples were to spread the good news, not hoard the good news. Steve from Florida, when Satan is cast to earth playing Jesus, will he accuse the two olive branches of being the false prophet and the antichrist? Well, that's possible. Uh, Satan is known, one of his names is the accuser. Uh, but we will know who the two witnesses are if you're one of God's elect in particular. Uh, Zechariah chapter 4 uh, we learn there that the two witnesses, uh, the two anointed ones, the sons of oil, uh, the two witnesses, the olive branches, will be feeding uh, the 7,000 God's elect with oil. Uh, truth, in other words. Dorothea from Tennessee. Does it mean when the Bible says the dead in Christ shall rise first, uh, does this mean the people who are already dead their spirit goes back to their bodies in the grave and the grave will open and they will come out. Is that what this means? No, that's not what that means. The scripture you're talking about is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. And it states there, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. Uh, he's coming here. Why would Christians want to fly away in the rapture? And then in verse 13, uh, where the verse 13 tells us what the subject of First Thessalonians 4 is, which is where are the dead. Then in verse 15, 
It states, we who remain alive unto the coming of Christ, the second advent, shall not precede those who are asleep. In other words, those who are dead in Christ. But the, we don't need our flesh bodies ever again when they die. Would you want to go through the eternity in your flesh body? Uh, a body that gets sick? Uh, a body that ages? You know, we have something much better. It's called our spiritual body. Uh, the graves opening and the dead arising, that was a one-time thing in the book of John to prove that Jesus defeated death. Susan from Pennsylvania, Amos 7.1, are these grasshoppers literally or do they represent nations who will come against Israel in the latter days? Well, they are the locust army of Revelation chapter 9, uh, also Joel chapter 1 and 2 serve as a witness, second witness to the locust army there with Satan and his group. Scott from Wisconsin, I have recently discovered that the normal gestation, and I'm out of time and I don't want to rush this question, so Scott, I promise you'll be first up uh, in our next program. I am out of time and I want you all to know that I do love you a great deal. Why? Because you enjoy studying God's Word in depth. Uh, you don't just scratch the surface. You like to plow deep and understand God's Word. God loves you for that. And when He looks down and He sees you reading the letter He wrote to you, the Bible, it makes His day. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, won't you help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others as well? There's one thing that's most important, though, and it's this. You stay in His Word every day. Every day in your Father's Word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? It's Jesus is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.